everyone welcome back to my channel h and &E life i'm dr cindy wong and today i want to share some tips for pathology residency these are things that i've done myself or i've heard from other co-residents that they found useful or just things that i'm seeing current residents do that i was like wow i that's a really good idea anyway so these are tips hopefully by following some or all you know help you get through residency and get through it as smoothly as possible Residency is just hard and pathology residency is of course easier than most, but it's still a residency. It's still very demanding. There's still always going to be those days where you come close to or even over 80 hours a week. But in the overall scheme of things, pathology residency is not the most tiresome or labor intensive or grueling. Uh, that said, I'm hoping that these tips will help you guys through it. So let's just get started. I'm going to break everything into uh, the following categories grossing tips there's gonna be previewing tips there's gonna be tips about how to write the pathology reports and of course the autopsy report and then I'll also be talking about studying in pathology residency as well as uh, tips for your fellowship application and finally just some tips that I couldn't think which subcategory fits so some miscellaneous tips anyways let's get started so I feel like a good chunk of my tips goes to grossing because I am a strong believer that if you're not good at grossing, then you're not going to be as good incorporating that information into your diagnoses and writing proper reports. And especially if you want to stay in academics and you want to be an attending in an academic institution, grossing is something you have to be good at. You have to have a solid foundation. You have to be able to, you will be able to teach it to residents and who knows, maybe even some of your fellows. So when it comes to grossing, I feel like a lot of these tips are really aimed for, I guess this entire video is aimed for the, you know, first year residents who have not established their own style yet. And so let's start with my first grossing tip. Always read the grossing manual. Do not start cutting anything until you've read the grossing manual because without having a solid plan established in your head on how to grow something, you should not be cutting anything. And you should always read the gross manual. And if there's stuff in that gross manual you don't understand, you should be asking someone. Now, the second thing that kind of correlates to this is before you cut into any specimen, you should know the history of that specimen. So what I mean by this is you want to know if this colon was taken out for cancer or is taken out for some benign cause like IVD. So maybe I should have said this first. Maybe the very first thing you should do when you're grossing is to know the history of the specimen you're grossing. Then you should read the grossing manual. And then if you have questions, you should ask someone, the PA, a senior resident, or your attending. It's always good to ask your attending because they have the final say on it because they are the one who in the end will be looking at the slides that's generated, reading the gross description, and finalizing the report. They want to make sure that they could trust who grows their specimen. So a tip that will help you when it comes to grossing and staying organized while you gross because, well, to be honest, if you get a huge cancer resection, it's going to take up a lot of your table space versus a, some neat little biopsy. But it's always good for these larger resections to lay out the cassettes in front of you from one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. That way, as you're submitting, then you'll know exactly like this is the first section I've taken. This is the first section I'm submitting and it's for sure going to go to go into cassette number one. And then you could write down to the gross description and so on and so forth. It, uh, honestly, to save time when I do this is I would actually uh, plan the sections I'm taking. So for example, if it's a cancer resection, I always write the first cassette or two is for the margins. And then the second cassette is always for represent sections of the tumor and then so on and so forth and so i've already dictated that i will use the first seven cassettes for this then i could just submit the seven sections without interrupting and typing again so this is another good thing and another very important thing is when you are laying your specimens out never open more than one bucket because the worst thing that could happen is you submit something from another bucket and into a cassette that went to something else. And for example, if it was uh, additional margins or it was like, oh, biopsy of omentum or for some reason you put a cancer section in it, if it was not easily identifiable as, oh, this should have been a section of colon versus this should have been a section of fat, 
but if it was like you know you accidentally put a section of a tumor deposit into what was supposed to be a biopsy of a mentum and then you see cancer there then when it was not metastatic there now because that section is there now it's like oh no that's metastatic so things like this it is very important not to open too many boxes have too many cassettes laid in front of you and start tossing things from different parts so the next tip is always using the right tool for the job. So what I mean by this is a scalpel is truly meant for a small specimen. A larger specimen, you'll need to use a trim blade, the long, very sharp blades. And I know these trim blades sometimes scare people because they're it's just so sharp, the tiniest cut on your hand and you'll be bleeding. But honestly, for something that's really large and you're trying to cut it with a scalpel, not only would you have bad sections, this is actually something that could cause you to cut yourself because you're just tr struggling to cut through this and then you could actually cut yourself in the meantime. It's much safer to actually just use the trim blade and just make one nice section. For example, bony specimens. Uh, well, bony things cannot be cut by a scalpel or by a trim blade. Instead of trying to force your scalpel through a piece of bone, you might have to take it to the diamond saw or the bone saw and have to, you know, those big machines look scary, but it's better than trying to stab your way through with a scalpel and then having the scalpel break and having, you know, a shard of the scalpel like fling back into your face. So don't, don't cut bone with scalpel, take it to the diamond saw. And if you're unsure how to operate a diamond saw, always ask for help and demonstration how to do it. And there are things that you should, for example, there's bony things you shouldn't even use a diamond saw on. If you get a femoral head for cancer, you are not going to cut that femoral head with a diamond saw. That's that's not going to work. It's going to take forever. You're probably going to break the diamond saw before you finish cutting your specimen. So times like that, you have to use a legit bone saw uh, or you have to just as as crude as it is, there are these hand bone saws that really would work if you put enough force into it. So all of that is better than cutting big, hard femoral heads than using the diamond saw. So this is what I'm saying, like make sure to use the right tool and this will actually, even though the tool is more scary, prevent actual physical harm to you when you're cutting. So another tip while you're cutting is when you are cutting into a specimen, it's almost always, always the case where you should cut off the margins and submit them into the cassettes first. Don't wait until the end to look for your margins because you might have accidentally cut through it or damaged it in some way. So always find your margins and always submit them first. Even, I, I don't even know why you would not submit them first, but just do it, please, please, for me, for me, please just submit your margins first. As you submit, just make sure you submit what you write in your gross description. What I mean by this, don't just say tumor. You could write that if the whole section was tumor, but if, for example, if you took a section where it's cancer in relation to margin, then you should write that. Cancer with relation to blot margin. So for example, if you had like a colon and the colon tumor is really close to the distal margin, sometimes it's, it's good to take sections perpendicularly so you'll have tumor to the closest distal margin. And that is a good thing to have in your growth description. So it's always good to be a little descriptive of what sections you're taking. That way it's good for the person who didn't grow it to know how you grow the specimen. Another thing as you're taking your sections is if it's an important section, always for talk, take a photo of it. Or even before you cut, maybe it's a good time to take a photo of it. So uh, most of the time, whoever triages the specimen once they first open it fresh, they'll take the photo. If not, then it's good for you to take a photo while it's already been fixed. And then when you take sections, especially if you're cutting through the tumor, just slap down a section or two and take a photo of the sections of tumor. That way you could see the relations to the edges, to the deep invasion, to whatever you want to show. It's always good to take more pictures and less pictures because once the specimen is gone, you can't take any more pictures. And you never know. It's always good to take nice pictures because you never know. Maybe this thing is super cool and you'll get to write a paper on it or you could write a case report on it and you always want a nice clean picture to show.
And then in terms of your tissue, now that you've taken, now if you cut the thing up, don't throw things away that you think is unimportant. Never throw away tissue. If you cut and then you trim for your section, now it's a perfect section to submit to your cassette. You're like, eh, I don't need this other half or this little chunk of tissue. Don't toss it into the biohazard bag. Don't don't do that. Just toss it back in the formula bucket. You never know when you need to go back and submit something else. So you don't throw away tissue. Always toss it back in the formula bucket. And the last, last tip for grossing, honestly, I feel like it's probably very important, is always do a glove check. Um, you, when you sometimes... I've definitely done this multiple times myself where I just get to grossing and I gross for an hour and a half straight. And then at the very end of it, as I'm cleaning up, I look that my glove actually had like a like a, a nick in it and my thumb has been sitting in formalin for like an hour basically and then I have formalin thumb and that's just no fun. So just check your gloves every now and then. Uh, it's always a good idea to double gloves. Now I'm going to talk about tips for previewing and I might see there might be a little similar theme to the first tip I gave for grossing is to look for the clinical history. Well, you know, we all kind of expect that the grocer has given us a clinical history, but you know, when time gets tough, the grocer just could write like a simple cancer and move on. But you as the resident who's not previewing the case, you want to look more into the uh, history, you know, to get the pertinent other me medical background. So for example, if you think that this is a person who has cancer and they received chemotherapy or they receive radiation or something, but you want to have a better history uh, written down when you're previewing it's because your attending will also find it very helpful if you bring them a uh, history for every case. And then uh, the other thing is when you're previewing to save you time later is it might be worthwhile to just start typing in your preliminary diagnoses or uh, to at least jot it down. So you're not like just looking at the slide moving, moving and be like, oh yeah, I think it's this. And then when you come to an attending, you've seen so many slides and you might just forget if you don't write it down or you don't type it into the report or, or something like that. So it's always to save your time and save the attending time is to jut down your thoughts as you are previewing. And then it's always nice to have a diagnosis when you're previewing, but if you don't have a diagnosis when you're previewing, just jot down some thoughts about what you see. For example, if you have a cancer case and you don't know what it is, just jot down what kind of cells you see, if it's a spindle or if it's epithelioid, if it's like super pleomorphic or it's not, what kind of background it's in. So that way you could show the attending at least, you could talk with them be like, I see this, this, and this, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Or if you're more senior, you should be like, well, I'm not quite sure what it is, but here's the stains I want to order. These are IHCs I think will help you pick the diagnosis or so on and so forth. So it's always good when you are previewing to kind of start thinking this cycle. Um, even if you're starting up and you have no idea what you're doing, it's always good to have some opinions than no opinion. And it, it translates when you go and talk to your attending. If you had some sort of opinion, it's always good to talk with your attending while signing out. I feel like most attendings would much prefer being an interactive teaching session than a one-way thing where the attending talks nonstop and you just like sit there quiet. So it also shows interest if you also, you know, have your opinions and speak your opinions during sign out. So the next thing will be writing reports. Let it be autopsy reports or let it be pathology reports. The thing I would recommend for each of them is always go into the report and type up the thing while they're still fresh in your head. So for example, if you just came back from a t signing out with attending and an attending has a case that was very difficult and challenging and gave you a lot of thoughts, it's good to start typing that all down then waiting to do it later where you're like, oh, let me just go gross first. Now come back and I'll write these reports. And at that point I'm like, oh, what did my attending say about this? <laughs> so it's always nice to write those while it's still fresh, especially for autopsy reports. Gosh, especially if you do more than one autopsy a day or you have multiple autopsies lined up, um, there would be times in residency where we would have four autopsies to do or, uh, and we'll do two in one day, two in another day. Um, and even then, I would highly recommend to write down the gross description, like the the external and internal gross description the day of that autopsy because after you've done four, even though you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna totally remember that each of the bodies are distinct, all of the stuff you see will start 
blending in and if you start forgetting what you saw in during the autopsy then it's kind of like half of the autopsy report is now like like forfeited because half of an autopsy report is basically what you saw the other half is what the histology correlate was so you should definitely always try to write the autopsy gross descriptions as soon after the autopsy as possible and then in terms of writing reports so if you don't know how to write something or how to describe something grossly you can always <laughs> go and look up previous reports that was written so for example for an autopsy you are not quite sure how to write this thing uh, or, or describe what you see you could go into the old autopsy reports and search for similar uh, findings and then see how they wrote it and then not necessarily copy and paste it but of course uh, use whatever is pertinent in your current case and add additional details similarly you could do that for gross descriptions for example the very first time I had to gross a stoma um, I had no idea what to write for it because for some of the complicated bigs um, you'll have a, a grossing template to follow but for something as simple as a stoma it's just like oh oh my god there's no grossing template now i have to freeform it i was like i don't i don't know how to freeform it so i looked up how other people have described stomas in the past and that's how i wrote up my grossing description and after a while it's like i could freeform anything i don't you know really at this point i don't need a grossing template anymore i could just start freeforming on top of my head but when you have no idea how to freeform something you could always look up how it was done previously and it will be a good test template for you to write your current case on. Okay, I think this video has already gone pretty long, so I will cut it here today and uh, I will talk about the rest of my tips for residency in the video that I will be posting later. So if you like what I'm doing, please like and subscribe and I'll see everyone next time. Bye!